Historians have written about the events and people of the end of the 18th century that the American and French revolutions opened up an era of glory seekers. But among the dozens of famous princes and statesmen, generals and reformers of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, none could match the two rulers of human destinies, Emperor Alexander I of Russia and Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte of France. The gripping dramatic contest between the two giants determined the history of the 19th century. Napoleon Bonaparte was born into a family of modest Corsican gentry. Grand Duke Alexander Pavlovich came into the world in a luxurious suite of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. In accordance with feudal customs, these two men should never have met, but both Alexander and Napoleon, from their early years, set about to destroy the ancient feudal monarchies, one in the east, the other in the west. Despite the great social distance between them, both the scion of a Corsican gentleman and the Russian Grand Duke were engulfed by a mighty historical stream, known as the Age of Enlightenment. Alexander Radishev, Russian writer and rebel, called the 18th century an age of madness and wisdom. And probably most of his contemporaries would have shared his view. Many philosophers and authors of European renown believed that global changes were at hand, although debates went on in the salons about what these would be like and whether one should wait for liberty, equality, and fraternity promised by the rulers of minds, or to prepare for bloodshed and warfare. People's outlook changed as suddenly and rapidly as the political map of the world. The Age of Enlightenment was not lacking in armed conflicts. Great Britain succeeded in ousting the French from India and Canada, but lost her North American colonies, which rose against British rule in 1775. King Louis XV of France strove to assert his realm's dominance in Europe, but suffered one failure after another. During the Seven Years' War, the French troops were crushed by King Frederick the Great of Prussia, allied to the British. In 1768, war broke out between Turkey, the Crimean Khanate, encouraged by the cabinet of Louis XV, and the Russian Empire. Russia's Baltic fleet, under the overall command of Count Alexei Orlov, a favorite of Empress Catherine II, entered the Mediterranean, blockaded Turkish squadrons in the Bay of Chesme, and, after a fierce engagement, reduced them to ashes in the summer of 1770. On the 21st of July, the Russian land army, under Pyotr Rumyantsev, utterly destroyed the main Ottoman forces at the Battle of Kagul. In 1772, Austria, Russia, and Prussia accomplished the first partition of Poland. The sovereignty of this kingdom, always supported by French politicians, was effectively brought to an end. France was retreating on all fronts, while Russia and Britain augmented their dominions.
King Louis XV died in May 1774. Contemporaries knew him as one of Europe's most amorous monarchs. But France was celebrated not only for the beauties of her court. Under Louis XV, French culture conquered the world. The enlightened ideas of Rousseau, Voltaire, Diderot, D'Alembert, and others attracted some princes as well as their subjects. Among the admirers of French literature and philosophy were the Russian Empress Catherine II, King Frederick the Great of Prussia, and Emperor Joseph II of Austria. Of all the ideas of the Enlightenment, the notion of the boundless opportunities of human reason was particularly influential, since it offered hope that the whole of society could be reconstructed on rationalist principles. From the reign of Peter the Great onwards, especially in the time of Catherine II, French politicians closely and suspiciously observed the Russian Empire's rise to power. They believed that barbarous semi-Asiatic Muscovy must be kept away from civilized Europe. Cardinal de Fleury, first minister of Louis XV, devised the so-called Eastern Barrier Doctrine in order to surround Russia with a cordon of hostile states, including Sweden, Poland, and Turkey. However, Russian victories over the Turks and Poles undermined this cordon, and the influence of the great northern empire in European affairs grew even stronger. The accession of Louis XVI did not bring about reforms long awaited in France. An earnest man, indifferent to luxury and amorous adventures, Louis XVI faithfully upheld the privileges of royal power and those of the nobility and clergy until the last days of his reign, while French society was haunted by a foreboding of imminent revolution. The people of Corsica experienced fully the military and political upheavals of the century of madness and wisdom. For a long period, Corsica was controlled by the Genoese. In 1755, the island was liberated by its inhabitants under Pascal de Paoli, but in 1768 it was invaded by a French army. Among those who fought under Paoli's banner was a petty local landowner named Carlo Maria Bonaparte, a native of Ajaccio. The dangers of the campaign were shared by his 18-year-old wife Letizia, née Ramolino, famed all over Corsica for her beauty. Letizia was already pregnant with her second son, who, in a few decades, became known as the Antichrist in one half of Europe and Napoleon the Great in the other. In 1769, the Corsican cause was lost and the French occupied the island. Carlo Bonaparte returned home to Ajaccio. On the 15th of August, Napoleon Bonaparte was born. Like most Corsican families, the Bonapartes had numerous offspring. Eight of their 13 children survived. Apart from Napoleon himself, the most famous of them were Joseph, Lucien, the lovely, if sly, Caroline, 
and the flighty charmer, Poln. The great strategist-to-be won his first battles in Maleob Street, where the Bonaparte family resided. War games easily led to heated street fighting and were Napoleon's principal obsession. On the 12th of May, 1779, Napoleon's father sent him to France to study at the Brienne Military School. One of Bonaparte's schoolmates was Goudin, who was to become a brilliant division general of the Grande Armée. Military sciences at the school were taught by Charles Pichegru, who later turned into one of the best commanders of Republican France and an implacable political opponent of Bonaparte. But the teacher was outdone by his pupil. The tiny Corsican was withdrawn proud and selfish and shunned his fellow students. He preferred to read books and live in his own fanciful world. In 1784, Bonaparte was transferred to the Paris Military School as one of the most promising cadets. But he did not stay there long. On the 24th of February, 1785, his father succumbed to stomach cancer. On hearing the sad news, Napoleon promptly took upon himself the support of his family. On the 28th of October, 1785, he left the Paris school with the rank of sub-lieutenant and had to bear the drudgery of the La Faire Regiment quartered in the city of Valence. The junior artillery officer tried to save every sou and sent most of his salary to his mother. The young Bonaparte diligently studied mathematics, artillery, military history and geography. He was ready for anything to escape poverty. In 1789, on the eve of the revolution, he even attempted to join Russian service, but the terms offered did not satisfy the lieutenant. Like many other Frenchmen, he devoured the works of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, quickly embraced republican ideas, and developed a hatred for tyrannical monarchs who deprived their subjects of happiness and freedom. He missed Corsica and secretly despised her oppressors, the very royal soldiers whose uniform he was obliged to wear. He records in his diary, Always alone among men, I return to my dreams only when I am left to myself. So he was to remain until the end surrounded by a throng of soldiers, marshals, courtiers, kings and queens who sought his favours, but always alone in this crowd, full of deeply concealed grand projects, which astonished not only his contemporaries, but his descendants as well. Bonaparte himself would have been very surprised if he had learned that a young Russian prince was obsessed with similar ideas among the luxury of St. Petersburg palaces. On the 27th of June, 1762, the carriage of Empress Catherine II escorted by the officers and men of the Ismailovsky and Semyonovsky guards, led by the Arlov brothers, arrived in the heart of St. Petersburg. The horse guards were swiftly coming together from all sides. Incessant cheers were heard from the soldiers and the populace. While the bells of the Kazansky Cathedral were ringing, its cross-bearing clergy headed the procession before the carriage. 
it was a coup called by some a revolution. This palace revolution dethroned Emperor Peter III, who failed to notice that his own wife had conspired against him. Peter did not resist the rebel guards and signed his abdication. In a few days, the Russian court saw just how deadly was the grip of their new autocratic ruler. With cruel irony, Catherine herself wrote of her husband's fate to her former lover, the Polish prince Stanislav Poniatowski. I have sent the deposed emperor under Alexei Orlov, accompanied by four officers and a detachment of chosen men, to a place twenty-five versts away from Peterhof called Ropsha, which is very secluded and most pleasant, until good and suitable rooms were prepared at Schlusselburg. Peter was soon killed by Alexei Orlov's men in a chamber of the Ropsha Palace. Catherine proved that she could not only fight for power, but also use it effectively. She succeeded in everything, waging victorious wars, heading administrative and military reforms, patronizing the arts and sciences, and wiping out the fierce army of rebellious peasants and Cossacks led by Yemelyan Pugachev. Catherine the Great sat on her blood-stained throne for decades, and all that time she was tormented by fears that an enemy lived next door. That enemy was her own son and heir to the crown, the Grand Duke Paul. Catherine entrusted Paul's upbringing to her chancellor, Count Nikita Panin, a subtle politician and diplomat who covertly opposed unlimited autocracy. Panin failed to endow his ward with constitutional principles, but he did manage to foster a hatred for his mother, whom the Grand Duke regarded as a murderess. Paul became the focus of attention for anyone who was not content with Catherine's rule. In his residence at Gachina, the heir apparent created his own world, which somewhat resembled the military regime of the Prussian monarchy, with its rigid discipline and barrack way of life. With growing impatience, he awaited Catherine's demise, so that he could finally inherit the empire which was rightfully his, and introduce an ideal, in his view, order throughout. Catherine could feel some relief only after Paul's consort, Sophia Dorothy, Princess of Württemberg, her orthodox name was Maria Fyodorovna, gave birth to a son on the 23rd of December, 1777. The Empress immediately took her grandson under her own wing. The boy was christened in honor of the medieval hero, Prince Alexander Nevsky who defended Russia against the Swedes and Teutonic Knights in the 13th century. Tacitly, but persistently, she looked for a way to remove Paul from power forever. His son Alexander seemed to her the most suitable candidate for the throne. Lovely as an angel, he was very bright and intelligent for his age. I am out of my mind over him. Catherine remarked about her grandson.
With far-reaching political goals, the Empress closely supervised her grandson's education. Alexander's principal tutor was General Nikolai Soltikov, and theology was taught by his confessor, Archpriest Andrei Somborsky. From the summer of 1783, Alexander's upbringing and education was in the hands of Frédéric César de la Harpe, a native of Switzerland. An expert in contemporary philosophy, La Harpe instilled elevated ideas to his ward so that he could become an enlightened monarch. In 1815, at the height of his glory, Alexander said, If it were not for La Harpe, there would have been no Alexander. Alexander Pavlovich was caught between two hostile camps, those of his grandmother and her favorites, and the court of Grand Duke Paul at Gatchina. Catherine wished to see her grandson as an enlightened European, a connoisseur of the arts and sciences, an adherent of her complicated and flexible political doctrine, aimed at the expansion of the Russian Empire and eventually as an heir to supreme power. Paul desired his son to be a warrior, a model soldier, a defender of the throne on Paul's accession to it. Alexander shrewdly managed to satisfy the hopes of both parties, but permanent vacillation and hypocrisy weighed heavily on his mind and soul. Never trust anyone entirely was the only rule which Alexander invariably observed to the last in his relations with those around him. In late September 1793, the court of St. Petersburg celebrated the wedding of Grand Duke Alexander Pavlovich and Princess Louise of Baden-Baden, who assumed the orthodox name of Elizaveta Alexeyevna. The groom was 16 and his bride 14 years old. They seemed a brilliant couple to everyone. On the 11th of November 1796, Catherine the Great died after a 36-hour agony. The Empress was still alive when Paul rushed in from Gatchina and was already received as Emperor in the Winter Palace. Vice-Chancellor Bezborodko, in order to save his own career, delivered to Paul Catherine's manifesto, declaring Alexander heir to the throne. Paul threw the paper into a fireplace. Adherents of the new emperor flocked from Gatchina to the capital. Admiral Shishkov recalled that Paul's accession was regarded by many as an enemy invasion. Within an hour, everything has changed so much that another age, another life, another existence seemed to begin. In 1789, the rising of the commons in Paris led to the capture of the Bastille and turned absolute monarchy into a constitutional regime. The revolution did not stop there, and its flames gradually enkindled the whole country.
1792, the royal palace of the Tuileries was stormed. The Bourbon dynasty deposed, and France proclaimed a republic. After a protracted and bloody struggle between different factions within the National Convention, supporters of constitutional monarchy and moderate revolutionaries like Danton and Desmoulins were guillotined. Supreme power in France was seized by a clique of radical Jacobins under Maximilien Robespierre, formerly a lawyer. Robespierre, Couton, and Saint-Just controlled the country through the Obedient Convention and the Committee for Public Security. During their reign of terror, the Jacobins endeavored to impose a certain order in France to curb counter-revolution and profiteering, and to create strong armed forces. Bonaparte was impressed by their single-minded energy. As an ardent Corsican patriot, Bonaparte was mainly concerned with the destiny of his native island. After the events of 1789, he paid three visits to Corsica, trying to persuade Paoli to join forces with revolutionary France, but Paoli preferred British patronage. From then on, there was no way home for Bonaparte. War became his element, the war that raged within France and on her frontiers. Anti-Jacobin risings broke out in Lyon, Toulon, and the province of Vendée. The armies of Austria, Prussia, Britain, and Spain were fighting Republican troops in Holland, the Rhineland, and Switzerland in the Alps and Pyrenees. Bonaparte quickly realized that a revolutionary career is easily made by means of words and letters. Accordingly, in 1793, he produced a literary pamphlet entitled Supper at Beaucaire, where he revealed himself as an avid Jacobin. His exercise in literature proved rewarding when he was assigned as artillery captain to the army of General Carteau, who besieged Toulon. Bonaparte strove hard to convince the general that his own plan to capture the city was the best. Augustin Robespierre, commissar of the convention and brother of the Parisian dictator, admired supper at Beaucaire and steadily supported Captain Cannon, as Napoleon was nicknamed in the army. The latter's plan of attack was finally approved. The bombardment of Toulon's bastions, conducted according to Napoleon's plan, played a decisive role in the siege. Bonaparte personally headed one of the columns to storm the city's principal fort, known as Little Gibraltar. Toulon fell on the 16th of December, 1793. Augustin Robespierre wrote to his brother in Paris, that man is endowed with supernatural talents. 
On the 14th of January, 1794, the convention promoted Bonaparte to the rank of Brigadier General. In 1794, the revolutionaries, who were scared by the regime of terror introduced by the government of Robespierre, Saint-Just, and Couton, sent their leaders themselves to the guillotine, and declared an end to violence. Power in France now belonged to the Directoire, under Paul de Barras. This body consisted of Jacobins who amassed sizable fortunes during the revolution and wished to enjoy them without any fear of the guillotine. Bonaparte was suspected of loyalty to Robespierre and spent some time in prison, but was soon set free. Barat remembered his role at the siege of Toulon, and when Paris was in danger of a royalist rising, General Bonaparte was recalled to command the troops of the Directoire. On the night of the 4th of October, 1795, 40 artillery pieces, skillfully positioned by Bonaparte in the streets of Paris, scattered the mutineers with great shot. In order to fasten Napoleon to his political chariot, Barat introduced him to Josephine Beauharnais. This creole beauty, widow of the executed general Beauharnais, was Barat's mistress for a while. Getting tired of her, he slyly palmed her off to the newfangled commander of the interior army. Napoleon fell madly in love for the first and last time in his life. Their marriage took place on the 9th of March, 1796. A week before his wedding, Bonaparte was appointed commander-in-chief of the Italian army. French troops in Italy were scanty, poorly armed, hungry and shabby, and barely managed to hold out in the Maritime Alps. Turning up in the headquarters of the Italian army, Bonaparte began by snubbing his generals, who regarded the 27-year-old commander as a kid. Napoleon coolly addressed these words to the insolent giant Augereau. General, you are a head length taller than myself, but if you will be rude to me, you could lose this advantage. Having intimidated his subordinates, Napoleon led the 30,000 strong Italian army along the narrow passage between the Maritime Alps and the Mediterranean Sea. On the 12th of April, 1796, he suddenly descended upon the Sardinian army, an ally of the Austrians. Before long, Sardinians were vanquished at Motinot and withdrew towards their capital, Turin. After a series of defeats inflicted with lightning speed, the Sardinian king, Victor Amadeus, capitulated. The Austrian commander-in-chief, Field Marshal Beaulieu was surprised to find out that his ally had disappeared, but Bonaparte did not leave him much time for contemplation. On the 10th of May, 1796, Beaulieu's forces were utterly discomfited at the Battle of Lodi. On the 26th of May, the French entered Milan and were welcomed by exultant Italians. Under the protection of French bayonets, New republics took shape in Italy by October, the Transpadanie and the Cispadanie, 
which in June 1797 formed a united Cisalpine Republic. Bonaparte supported the Italian Republicans despite the mistrust of the Directoire. For Napoleon, the time of European fame and glory had come. Within a month, his victory at Lodi became as widely known in Germany and Britain as in France. Those who were disgusted with absolutist regimes in Russia, Prussia and Austria rushed to the banner of the Republican general. Stondal, who heard many eyewitness accounts, related an interesting detail about the army's attitude to its commander. Napoleon's youth was the reason for a peculiar custom that arose in the Italian army. After each battle, the bravest soldiers held a council and advanced their young general to the next rank. When he returned to the camp, seasoned veterans greeted him with his new promotion. At Lodi, he was created Corporal, hence Napoleon's nickname, Little Corporal, which long survived among his soldiers. To become full master of Italy, the little corporal only had to conquer the mighty fortress of Mantua. However, the siege was taking too long, while another Austrian field marshal, Wurmser, swiftly moved to relieve the garrison of Mantua with 60,000 men. On the 5th of August, 1796, Wurmser was beaten at Castiglione and locked up in Mantua with all that remained of his troops. Field Marshal Alvinzi rushed to assist Wurmser with 50,000 Austrians. Napoleon, who had only about 30,000, met Alvinzi at Artcoli. Ferocious fighting went on for three days, from the 15th to the 17th of November, 1796. The heat of battle and the stakes in the game were so high that Bonaparte could not stay behind with his staff when he noticed that Augereau's column failed to capture the bridge of Arcole. Most of the French generals were gravely wounded, trying to inspire their soldiers, wrote Stondal. Napoleon himself joined the assault at the head of his grenadiers. Met by a hail of grape shot, they have to retreat. Napoleon is caught in a swamp. For a moment, he almost falls into enemy hands, but they do not see how precious their prize is. Then the grenadiers rush back to rescue their general and take him away. Alvinci was defeated and fell back. A month later, he was reinforced to make another attempt. This time, Napoleon intercepted the field marshal at Rivoli, where he virtually destroyed the Austrian army on the 14th and 15th of January, 1797, taking nearly 20,000 prisoners. Mantua capitulated. The victorious general marched on Vienna. Archduke Charles, the best of Austrian strategists, tried to contain Bonaparte without success. When the Austrian plenipotentiary arrived in the headquarters of the Italian army to start peace negotiations, Vienna was only about 150 kilometers away. Napoleon literally dictated his terms of the truce, whereby Vienna was to give up Austrian possessions in northern Italy and Belgium. Count von Kobenz, the minister of Emperor Franz II, tried to delay the ratification of these terms, but in a fit of rage, Bonaparte flung an expensive vase on the floor and yelled at Kobenzl, This means war. Remember, before autumn sets in, I will smash your empire as I smashed this porcelain. On the 17th of October, 1797, the Austrian delegation signed the peace treaty at Campo Formio.
Napoleon returned to Paris on the 7th of December 1797 as a conqueror. The Directoire wallowed in wrangling and corruption and was wary of the general's bid for power. But Napoleon proposed an unexpected plan to Barra. In order to humiliate England, we have to seize Egypt, he declared. The British preferred to fight their opponents by depriving them of colonies. Bonaparte decided to use their own strategy against them. The Directoire readily accepted the General's plan in the just belief that the further he got from Paris, the safer they would feel. On the 19th of May, 1798, an enormous caravan of 350 ships sailed from the port of Toulon. For his Egyptian expedition, Napoleon selected 38,000 veterans of Italian campaigns. He was accompanied by Lain, Davout, Berthier, Murat, and Bessier, who were to win renown as his marshals. Brilliant revolutionary commanders like Desir and Kleber also travelled towards the unknown. On the 2nd of July, 1798, the military expedition disembarked near Alexandria, and on the 21st, the Mameluk army under Murat Bey was routed by Napoleon in the famous Battle of the Pyramids. But in a few days, the French fleet was completely destroyed by the British Admiral Nelson at Aboukir. From then on, Napoleon could only rely on himself and his soldiers. Egypt was conquered, but this seemed insufficient to the tireless Napoleon. He wished to raise the entire Orient against the loathsome British. Europe is a mole's hole, he said scornfully to his secretary Bourrien. There have never been such great empires and great revolutions here as in the East inhabited by 600 million people. Bonaparte carried on with a corps of 18,000 men to Syria, hoping to break through to India from there. At the time, Syria belonged to the Turkish Sultan, and hostilities became even more intense. The Turks were vanquished at Jaffa. Napoleon's army captured 2,000 of them. Irritated by unforeseen difficulties and sensing failure, Bonaparte ordered them to be shot. However, with British help, the Turks managed to check the advance of their formidable opponent at the fort of Saint-Jean-d'Acre, which successfully defied a siege by the French. On the 20th of May, 1799, Napoleon began his retreat to Egypt. The Turks attempted a counter-offensive and landed a corps of 15,000 men at Aboukir. But on the 25th of July, Bonaparte attacked and destroyed it. Soon he came across some European newspapers and learned from them that French troops were ousted from northern Italy by Suvorov, who considered marching on Paris. I must go. Napoleon exclaimed. Leaving command to General Kleber, he departed for France on the 23rd of August, 1799. The French people who were exhausted by the Directoire's inept rule, by endless wars and poverty, 
gave Napoleon a rapturous welcome befitting the savior of the nation. One member of the Directoire, the devious and ambitious Emmanuel Joseph C., regarded Bonaparte as the man who could rid him of his worthless colleagues. Napoleon's brother, Lucien, was recently elected president of the Council of the Five Hundred, the lower chamber of the French Parliament, which made the coup much easier. On the 18th of Brumaire, or the 9th of November, 1799, troops loyal to Bonaparte dispersed the legislative bodies. The country was now governed by three consuls, Bonaparte, Sier, and Roger Ducot. Naturally, the principal part in this triumvirate was played by Napoleon. Napoleon believed that the main achievements of the revolution, especially those concerned with the redistribution of property, must be preserved, but extremes had to be avoided. The people of France should no longer be divided into supporters and opponents of the revolution. Napoleon the Consul proclaimed, I am opening a broad way for everyone to attain their own goals. One of Napoleon's chief concerns was to put an end to warfare. His proposals of peace to King George III of Great Britain and Emperor Franz of Austria did not succeed. But the consul still remained a general. Since Russian Emperor Paul I quarreled with the Austrians and recalled Suvorov's forces home, Napoleon hastily formed a reserve army crossed the Alps by the St. Bernard Pass and attacked the rear of the Austrian corps of Field Marshal Millat, who besieged Genoa. On the 14th of June, the celebrated Battle of Marengo was joined. In fact, the battle was very nearly lost by the French. By 3 p.m., the field appeared to be in enemy hands. Milla already dispatched couriers to announce his victory, and ordered Sach, his chief of staff, to pursue the conquered. But Dizé, who had earlier been sent towards Novi to thwart an encircling manoeuvre by the Austrians, heard the cannon blasts and rushed to assist his commander. Dizé's division vigorously attacked the Austrians and put them to flight, and thus victory was gained. On the 9th of February, 1801, peace talks between France and Austria began at Luneville. At the same time, Napoleon entered into negotiations with the ministers of Paul I of Russia about an alliance of the two nations. While European powers endeavoured to restore the House of Bourbon on the throne of France, Russia pursued her own national interests. Another defeat inflicted on the Ottoman Empire in the War of 1787 to 1791 allowed the Russians to secure the northern shores of the Black Sea. In 1794, the Russian corps commanded by Suvorov, routed the Polish insurgents under Tadeusz Kościuszko. In 1798, Austrian and British diplomats managed to persuade the new Russian Emperor Paul I to join the anti-French coalition. Field Marshal Alexander Vasilievich Suvorov of Rymnik headed the allied Russo-Austrian army in northern Italy. 
The Russo-Turkish fleet under Admiral Fyodor Ushakov began operations in the Mediterranean. Paul I hoped that victory could strengthen the strategic position of Russia in that region. Already in 1796, Suvorov keenly remarked of Bonaparte, Oh, that boy is going too far. It is time to calm him down. The Russian commander was not destined to meet Napoleon in the field of battle, but he did deal with a constellation of brilliant French generals like Moreau, MacDonald, Joubert, and Massena. Suvorov stunned them with his brisk strategy. From the 6th to the 8th of June, 1799, he routed MacDonald's army on the river Trebia, and on the 4th of August at Novi, he won another victory over Joubert, who was killed in action. In a few months, the whole north of Italy was purged of the French. The Austrians wanted to reap the fruit of Suvorov's triumphs, and suggested that Paul I transfer Russian troops to Switzerland and invade France from there. With 20,000 men, Suvorov fought his way through Alpine peaks, but after an extremely difficult campaign, he found out that the Russian corps under General Rimsky Korsakov was abandoned by the Austrians and defeated by Massena. Exasperated by Vienna's perfidy, Paul recalled his regiment's home. Striving to remedy the failures of Catherine the Great's reign, Paul renounced the ideas of enlightened monarchy. He thought that autocratic power had no need of any political compromise. With an iron hand, he imposed order in regiments of the Imperial Guard and severely punished negligent or dishonest officers. Dozens of courtiers, diplomats, and officials were banned from service. The secret expedition as political intelligence was known in those days, led an intensive search for conspirators and Jacobin agents. Paul did not trust his eldest son, since he knew of Catherine's plans to give the throne to Grand Duke Alexander, bypassing himself. Opposition to Paul, among high-ranking dignitaries and officers of the Guard, soon resulted in a conspiracy, headed by Vice-Chancellor Nikita Panin and Cavalry General Peter von der Palin, military governor of St. Petersburg. Other participants were regimental commanders of the Guard, Talizin of the Priabrozhensky, Depreradovich of the Semyonovsky, and Uvarov, of the Cavalier Guards. In the autumn of 1800, Palin informed Grand Duke Alexander of the plot. Some years after the coup, Palin himself retold how he managed to deceive the heir apparent. For the sake of truth, I have to say that Grand Duke Alexander never consented to anything until he demanded a sworn promise that no attempt would be made on the life of his father. I gave him my word and supported his intentions, although I was convinced they would not be fulfilled. Knowing full well that Paul should not survive the coup, Palin summoned to St. Petersburg a cold-blooded and courageous cavalry general, Leonti Benigsen, to accomplish their dreadful purpose.
While the conspirators were forming their shock squad, Emperor Paul discussed a Russo-French alliance with the First Consul. The British and Austrian governments aimed to deprive the Russian Emperor of any results of the victories gained by Suvorov and Ushakov in 1799, which incensed Paul so much that his diplomatic strategy made a sudden turn of 180 degrees. On the 30th of December, 1800, the Emperor addressed a personal letter to Napoleon. Those entrusted by God with the power to rule nations must think and care about their welfare. I do not speak and do not wish to argue about the rights of man, nor of the principles of various governments established in each country. Let us try to bring back to the world the peace and quiet which it so greatly needs. Negotiations between Paul and Napoleon reached a point when Paul himself proposed to the First Consul to start joint military action against Britain, which he believed had enforced her tyrannical regime on the seas. The British ambassador, Sir Charles Whitworth, closely followed the development of the conspiracy in the hope that after Paul's dethronement, Palin's clique would reject the Russo-French alliance. On the night of the 23rd of March, 1801, the conspirators divided into three groups, forced their way into the Emperor's bedroom at Mikhailovsky Palace. They brought him down on the floor, battered and kicked him, broke his head with a sword hilt, and finally strangled him with a scarf. Such was the brutal death of the Russian Emperor, Paul, son of Catherine the Great. On the 24th of March, 1801, the Empress Maria Fyodorovna, now a widow looking at her husband's mutilated corpse, said to her son, Now I congratulate you. You are the Emperor. Alexander Pavlovich fainted. Meanwhile, the First Consul had to face his own problems. On the 24th of December, 1800, Napoleon and Josephine survived only by a miracle when an infernal machine exploded on their way to the theatre. Hearing of Paul's assassination, Bonaparte trembled with rage and blamed it all on the British. They have missed me in Paris, but hit me in St. Petersburg, he cried. The Russian alliance was no longer a reality. They started a movement towards each other, the youthful Russian Tsar and the young consul of the French Republic. The tragic night of the 23rd of March, 1801, when Paul I was strangled with a scarf by those who were supposed to guard him, was the first point where the courses of their lives crossed. Mm -hmm.